Why did Muhammad fear Arabian poets so much as to have several of them assassinated? In ancient Arabia, poetry was a passion. Poets were highly regarded in society, and the words of many accomplished poets were regarded as next to Allah's words. In a desert land, bereft of much entertainment and natural relaxation, the ancient Arabs used to find solace, peace, tranquility, and even the raging emotion of war and revenge through the mesmerizing words of their poets. Poets supplied the Arabs with their mental and spiritual nourishment since they memorized the ancestry, deeds, glories, and achievements of their tribes and passed them on to future generations through their students or disciples to keep the records alive. Poets were actually the news media par excellence of Arabia. They were lethal weapons since a very capable and articulate poet of a small tribe could elevate it in poems to levels greater than a much more powerful one. As far as our research has demonstrated, no poet in the long period of the so-called Jahiliya period, that is before Muhammad and Islam, was ever murdered for what he or she recited, unlike what was done by Muhammad and his followers. There were more female poets among the Jahiliya Arabs than during the entirety of 1400 years of Muhammad and Islam. Some of these poetesses were so formidable that Muhammad had at least two of them assassinated because they satirized him. The following four chapters are actually connected, since it was Muhammad's aggressive and piratical actions to start with that triggered the responses of some of Arabia's poets. His followers claim that Muhammad is the apostle of peace. As you all know by now, nothing can be further from the truth. These four chapters are just more in our series that are exposing and revealing the very sadistic and cruel nature of Muhammad. We shall prove once more that he was in fact a terrorist, a criminal, and a mass murderer whose entire life was based on victimizing innocence and indulging in mindless violence, carnage, and massacre. He was a man who destroyed peace wherever he went, and in his place brought terror, plunder, rape, carnage, and death. When Muhammad first started shouting from the rooftops that he alone had the divine word of Allah, the people of Mecca ignored him. However, when he began insulting and defaming the religion of the peace-loving Meccans, they couldn't take it anymore and tried persuading him to stop. Muhammad the coward was too scared of the growing hostility against him, and knowing full well that his Allah could not strike down the Meccans, he crept out one night and fled for his life. Ever since that incident, Muhammad was determined to take revenge on them. He escaped to Medina, which had a sizable Jewish population, and started plotting his revenge with a small gang of criminals. This was the beginning of Muhammad's trail of violence, hatred, and bloodshed that would soon destroy all that was decent in the culture of Arabia. The Medina became the headquarters of the first organized crime syndicate in history. As we have shown in several of our chapters, the story has been documented in detail by his Muslim biographers. Surprise raids on trade caravans and tribal settlements. The use of plunder thus obtained for recruiting an even growing army of greedy criminals and desperados. Assassinations of opponents, blackmail, expulsion and massacre of the Jews of Medina, attack and enslavement of the Jews of Khaybar, rape of women and children, sale of these victims after rape, trickery, treachery and bribery, employed to their fullest extent to grow the numbers of his version of Islam. He organized no less than 86 expeditions, 26 of which he led himself without participating in the fighting. The motives of the converts to Muhammadan Islam was never in any doubt. D.S. Margolius states in his book, Muhammad and the Rise of Islam, of any moralizing or demoralizing effect that Muhammad's teaching had upon his followers, we cannot say with precision. When he was at the head of the robber community, it is probable that the demoralizing influence began to be felt. It was then that men who had never broken an oath learned that they might evade their obligations, and that men to whom the blood of their clan had been as their own began to shed it with impunity in the cause of Allah, fi sabilullah. That lying and treachery in the cause of Islam received divine approval. It was then, too, that Muslims began distinguished by the obscenity of their language. It was then, too, that the coveting of goods and wives possessed by non-Muslims was avowed without discouragement from the Prophet. The details of this 
criminal onslaughts in the form of piratical skirmishes and assassinations are chronicled in these chapters in a chronological manner. Please note that every time the Apostle of Peace committed one of his criminal acts, he always justified the crime by quickly claiming a divine revelation which conveniently removed the blame from his bloodied hands. These made-to-order surahs we shall recite after the description of the incident. Believers and unbelievers, be aware of the most important of all facts, that all the reports that we are going to recite to you are one-sided, since they were written by the victors, the Muhammadan Muslims. No one has any record of the victim side. Nonetheless, these records show clearly and without pulling any punches the true character of Muhammad and his followers. 1. The massacre of unarmed merchants during the sacred month of Rajab, 623 AD, at Nakhla. Four unarmed merchants were traveling to Mecca to sell their goods, consisting of resins, honey, and animal skins. It was the holy month of Rajab, which was considered sacred for trade in Arabia. It was a point of honor that any form of warfare or violence was strictly forbidden in this month. Muhammad's gang attacked the helpless men from behind and stabbed two of them to death. They plundered all the goods as booty and Muhammad got one-fifth of the share. This shows the utter lack of morals or scruples on Muhammad's part. The Prophet of Islam did not possess a shred of pity or kindness or the slightest sense of justice. He called bloodedly murdered two innocent people who had never done him any harm and did not even know him. All this was done in a month that the Prophet himself declared was a sacred month in which no warfare should take place. Muhammad was obviously motivated by nothing but hatred and greed. Conveniently, divine revelations came down from Allah that absolved him of all the guilt. Al-Baqarah 2.216 Warfare is ordained for you, though it is hateful unto you. But it may happen that you hate a thing which is good for you, and it may happen that you love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knoweth you knew not. Here Muhammad is completely removing all blame from himself for having started the fighting. The most insidious and devilish implication of this verse is that Allah is completely justifying and sanctioning Muhammad's murder of the innocent Meccans. Over and above this, Muhammad is conveniently implying that warfare is hateful to him, but that he instigated it because it was ordained by Allah. What moral sacrifices the apostle of peace had to make. Number two. Slaughter of the Meccans who came to defend their caravan, March, Ramadan, 623, the well of Badr. The merchandise being carried by this caravan was worth more than 50,000 gold dinars. Muhammad ganged up all the criminals of Medina and set out to raid the caravan with 300 men. The Meccans got word of the raid and sent out an army to protect the caravan. Throughout the entire battle, Muhammad cowered in a hut which his men made for him. There he cried and prayed with feverish anxiety. At one point, he came out of the hut and threw pebbles in the enemy's direction, screaming, Let evil look on your faces, and by him he holds my soul in his hands. Anyone who fights for me today will go to paradise. The Mohammedans killed over 200 and took 70 prisoners. All 70 of the prisoners were ransomed, and any prisoner who did not fetch a ransom had his head chopped off. Muhammad was gratified at the sight of his murdered victims. After the battle, he sent his followers to look for the corpse of Abu Jahl, one of the Meccans who had criticized him openly. When his corpse was found, they cut off the head and threw it down at Muhammad's feet. The Apostle of Peace cried out in delirious joy, Rejoice! Here lies the head of the enemy of Allah. Praise Allah, for there is no other but he. Muhammad then ordered a great pit to be dug, for the bodies of the innocents to be dumped. The Muslims then proceeded to hack the corpse's limbs into pieces. As the bloodied mass of bodies was being thrown into the pit, a feverishly excited Muhammad shrieked, O oh, people of the pit, have you found that what Allah threatened is now true? For I have found that what my Lord promised was true. Rejoice, all Muslims. One of the prisoners taken was defiant and Nadir ibn al-Harith, who had earlier taken Muhammad's challenge of telling better stories than him. Muhammad ordered Ali to strike off Nader's head in his presence so he could watch and exult in the pleasure of beheading the man who had insulted him. Another prisoner, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, was decapitated in front of Muhammad. Before being killed, the prisoner cried out pitifully, O oh Prophet, who will look after my children if I should die? The great Prophet of the religion of peace 
called this spat out hellfire as the blade came down and spattered his clothes with Uqba's blood. This time, Muhammad needed a revelation that would not only absolve him of all the guilt of murdering so many innocent people, but also give him the divine right to get a huge share of the plundered booty. Quite a few revelations magically appeared after the Battle of Badr.